So, hello everyone, uh, всіх вітаю сьогодні. Uh, скажу коротко про українське вступне слово. Uh, цей вакшоп, він буде тривати до кінця тижня. Він ділиться, як ви вже читали, мабуть, на сайті на дві секції про мистецтво та візуалізації даних. Їжі я вам ще більше про це скажу. Uh, Їжі безпосередньо буде проводити цей воркшоп. Я йому буду періодично допомагати, якщо, не будемо, якщо буде дуже багато питань. А, і Їжі сам приїхав, з, він родом з Чехії, з Праги. Працює він зараз в Німеччині в інституті Казус від Геринкольд Центру Дрезден Розендор. І він працює взагалі в фізиці плазми та в високопродуктивних обчисленнях, але також частково як його хобі додатково – це візуалізація даних 3D-графіка VR. І ну, от про це ви ще дуже багато почуєте на процесі цього тижня. В принципі, таке от коротке інтро я на цьому закінчу. А, так, і також є же дуже великий прихильник України, він дуже допомагає Україні. Якщо ви чули про таку організацію, як НАФО, то є же один із членів НАФО. І він зараз скаже більше. So, please, є же, вас to you. We are very glad to have you. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. I, uh, since last year my Ukraine improved so that I... Um understood like everything you said <laughs> but i won't try speaking in ukrainian like maybe next year so <laughs> as, as valaya said i already was here last year i'm from czech republic and working in this uh, institute in uh, called casus it's a uh, center for advanced systems understanding i originally started with plasma physics now i'm more focusing on uh, high performance computing uh, and simulations on large clusters. Uh, this place is in Gerlitz, which is at the German-Polish border here in, in Gerlitz, Gerlitz slash Zgorzelac. There was a famous uh, lens factory there for cameras. Uh, famous what? Uh, lens, uh, lens uh, manufacturing facility for cameras. Okay. Mayor optic. Okay, okay. I, I actually had no, I, uh, I, I had no idea, but uh, apart from, so, so, so historically, this region was used uh, for um, uh, coal mining. So there's a lot of uh, those uh, like surface coal mines. And now the, those have been closed since, since the 90s. They, uh, so, so, so they are like looking for other options, like how to replace the lost jobs and, and, and stuff like this with some new interesting jobs. I didn't know about lens manufacturing, that, that's pretty cool. But uh, apart from our institute, which uh, started in 2020, mm -hmm. they are now building uh, some astrophysics institute with, with, uh, with an observatory there. So like lenses make, make sense in, in, in that context. The question that I think plant uh, is, uh, I don't think it survives privatization of this policy. It's oh, okay. Broken. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, so so here uh, officially we are part of this Helmholtz Center in Dresden Rosendorf, which is in Dresden or Rosendorf, which is near Dresden. But like I said, I'm from Prague. So here. So basically I traveled from my job back to my home and then this time by train through Przemyśl to Kiev and I arrived yesterday, yesterday evening. Uh, this time I, I'm glad I had a, uh, I had a calm night. And yeah, so uh, I was already here last year teaching the same workshop, three workshops, oh, three weeks, nine workshops in total over those three weeks. Uh, so I spent one week here in Kiev, then one week in Dnipro and then one week in Lviv. This time I will be staying for three weeks in Kiev, and then one week in Dnipro, and then back home, because I, the German institution, while I came to them and told them what I was doing here, and that I think it was well received, and that I would like to repeat it, and uh, I was looking for some support, some official support from them. Unfortunately, unofficial, everyone was, oh, that's so great. Yeah, 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 of course we support you. 
And I'm like, yeah, okay, so uh, can we make it like an official business trip or something? Oh, no, 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 no that's not possible. Why not? Oh, because, you know, uh, the war and, and insurance wouldn't like, and I was like, I can like buy my own insurance, oh, which reminds me, yeah, I forgot to buy it. It's like, can you remind me in the afternoon I should do it? You'll have to talk to yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, you can do it online. It's fine, and it's not, not, not that expensive. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do it like by myself. Oh no, no, that's not possible. That's not like, you know, we have our German uh, papers, our German procedures. So I'm here officially on a vacation again, and uh, like uh, Volodya said, I'm also a member, if you can say so, of the. Of the Czech uh, NAFO community, I don't know who who of you have heard of NAFO, who hasn't heard of NAFO. So it's both somehow. <laughs> you didn't. Okay, great, great. great. So um, this Czech uh, Czech NAFO group is also doing uh, some demonstrations and activities in to support Ukraine in real life, not just online. But original NAFO is an online group. <laughs> online activist group and um, mm, yeah so one of uh, I mean we are online we are trying to debunk Russian disinformation and basically argue with the pro-Russian accounts online mostly on Twitter but in in Czech Republic we, we put this into real life and whenever there are pro-Russian demonstrations in Prague, which unfortunately still happen. Uh, the first one had maybe like 20,000 people in the center of Prague. Uh, then with each, the, the, the big ones are like twice a year and we always go there and to stand against them and to show that uh, not everyone in, in Czech Republic is on their side, but actually they are a minority. But they are a very loud minority, uh, so they and they like to pretend that like everyone agrees with them and stuff like this, which is not true. But you need someone to be there and show that it's not true. Uh, and yeah, how I came to this was right. So so technically, I'm taking a vacation days to be here, and uh, you might have heard that a lot of those. Uh, pro-Russian idiots like to. So we have a lot of refugees in Czech Republic. Yeah, uh, I even had some, some, some in my uh, my flat in Prague. Like right after the start of the invasion, some of them returned. They were from Dnipro, so now they're back home. And uh, of course, very often you you hear like, oh, but it's probably like there's no war or like it's 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 not that bad in Ukraine. The Ukrainians are going there. Uh, for vacation, yeah. you can imagine what the vacation means for a Ukrainian refugee. That's mostly uh, someone who go, comes here to visit, to I don't know, attend the funeral of 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 their family members, or 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 like see all the destruction around and that kind of stuff. So you normally wouldn't call that a vacation, right? The thing that technically, oh hello. The, that technically you need to take vacation days to go here is is not what makes it some you know like a happy funny uh, time off. So um, oh, oh, oh why did this something happen? Someone wants to join or joined or no? I don't know what happened. Nobody's oh, still sharing and recording. I don't know. Just close it. Okay, so um, this is what I did last year, or this the website you've seen. So I suppose you've also seen the uh, some of the pictures from last year. Uh, this is what it how it looked like here and. These are pieces of what uh, what we made here or on the other workshops. So at the end of the workshop, you will make a scene that can look something like this. This is a piece of the 
of the scientific visualization part and the for the artistic part like uh, you will produce uh, produce scenes like this where you can have a 3d scan of some object you like and and put it in the uh, in the virtual reality scene like after I, I'll explain the details later so uh, after la uh, after I've been here last year uh, I came back to Prague and together with uh, some of the students I made a an exhibition based on the technologies that that were used here. Uh, so I'll show you. This was the exhibition. Here is the. And there's a teaser here. So this was like a virtual scene which you could walk through in VR. And the concept was that uh, we had those three D scans of some cultural objects from Ukraine. We had three D scans of the of um yeah i'll show that later oh, oh, yeah the transport cases for artillery uh like gunpowder and we turned it into a three weeks long or two weeks long exhibition in the center of prague where we also auctioned the those uh, uh, those transport cases to support uh, yeah, yeah, some U Ukrainian um, charities, let's say. Oh no, it, it, it was specifically for a mobile hospital. I, I'll show which one later. So this is just wanted to show uh, the how we set up the exhibition. So so those those are the uh, the transport cases. I suppose you've seen those around. Uh, I got them from here from from Kiev. They were. Uh, painted by um, by children in Cherkasse, I think. Oh, I, I didn't know that. You didn't know what, yeah. it was Cherkasse. Like... Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so yeah. I, I think those those three were were, were painted in in Cherkasse and the uh, the big one in Kiev. But I got them here from from Alexa. <laughs> like I went and asked, oh, can I, when I was coming back, can I get something we can then sell to support like some Ukrainian soldiers or whatever, so something that I can easily fit in the car and get through the border. And he gave, he gave me this. <laughs> so I got it through the border. Uh, well, yeah, they searched my car. Like, like when they've seen it, they were like, oh my God, no, no, no. They they started searching my car the, the Polish side yeah and uh, and you'd be like it's, you didn't see my tank yet <laughs> <laughs> no I I I I I had like some some papers ready for them and in the end they 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 they, they let me through but like they, they stopped me and searched the car like they were literally looking into each like like taking off all the plastic parts on the car like like really trying to find if i'm not hiding something in uh, in the car frame or whatever and it took like 4 hours or 3 hours to to do this this whole procedure and they weren't sure i was like no it's like it's not working weapons it's basically scrap metal painted or painted scrap metal as yeah in, in the end i i, I was successful Another friend uh, who, who tried to do the same a couple of months later was not successful, but yeah. So sometimes it's it's okay, sometimes not. I, I, I don't know what was the current situation. So yeah, we had this empty room and it took us about three weeks of, mm -hmm. uh, of preparations to turn this empty room into a kind of like a, yeah, yeah, into, into the, the gallery thing, yeah? So... We had seven projectors, uh, which we put on the walls. So if you're doing such an exhibition, of course, it, it, it takes time. Uh, you take a lot of time to calibrate the projectors and 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 set up the space. And after many, many days of work um, in and and calibrating uh, 3D sensors, what, what we're doing, you'll see it on the video later. The, we take 
a 3D camera, which takes a 3D stream, live stream from the gallery and transform that stream into some, mm, some artistic interpretations of the points you're getting from the camera. So as from normal camera, you get points as like uh, mm, 2D coordinates and a color. And from the 3D camera, you also get the third coordinate, which gives you the depth, the distance from the camera. And uh, that can, yeah, that, that gives you a 3D live stream from the gallery. And I might, uh, I, yeah, I have the camera here as well. So, so we can try that. But what I will show you is uh, the um, how to make scans with your, with a phone app. That, and the scan will give you a 3D object and like a static 3D object, which we will put in the Unity scene and, and apply some effects on that object. But you can use the almost the exact same procedure not to have a static object, but this uh, live uh, 3D camera stream. And in this, uh, in this exhibition, we combined both. We also had some real objects. This is a uh, like a plastic painting by uh, a Czech uh, Czech author, we had some <laughs> fun enough of videos uh, running on 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 the screen, and uh, yeah, you can see the how the how the room is evolving. And this was already the opening day with a uh... oh no, cannot play cannot play video. That's really disappointing. But okay. Okay, I don't know if, if if it will work or not. Maybe I can show you the video later. We can. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, I will show you the video later. Uh, I mean, we, we don't have anyone on online anyway. So uh, for those who are watching this as a recording on YouTube or where, wherever we will upload it later, you will find those videos on the Resonant Ecos website. Uh, in a couple of weeks when I find time to upload them. Uh, for you here, uh, let's stop talking about the exhibition. Uh, I told you where I work and what I do. I showed you the map. And yes, the important thing, my t-shirt. Uh, on the t-shirt, this design, uh, you might recognize this, uh, this hand uh, with the bracelet that was I think from Irpin if I'm not mistaken it was like a famous photo like from the early early stages the, of the war or like after the full-scale invasion and there was a um, a designer from Slovakia who who turned this it into this uh, t-shirt design and they there's this uh, organization called Darek Pro Putina or Podarunek dla Putina, uh, which fundraises weapons for uh, fundraises weapons for Ukraine. And you can see that like they fundraising like big weapons. But it's a completely private fundraiser. They they got no money from the government. Uh, all this stuff has been fundraised from uh, from private donor donors, from Czech, uh, Czech private donors. So one of their, one of their first, yes, of course, our, our, our famous uh, Przemysl, uh, uh, and Przemysl and Victor are, are also being delivered by the Czech government. So this was like the Czech government is delivering something, and this 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 private fundraiser uh, delivers uh, some additional ones. Yes, we fundraised for a tank even. And so, so this was at the at, at the beginning uh, of the full scale invasion. You buy this T shirt for two thousand Czech crowns, so let's say three thousand hryvnias, and yeah, of course the cost of the T shirt is like three hundred, and the rest goes uh, the rest goes for the weapons and uh, other like medical material demining. Uh, demining uh, vehicles, and in total, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, they raised they raised oh yeah they they changing their website all the time. It was 
maybe here. They had, okay, I don't know where they put it now. Oh, here it is, okay. So this is the amount of money they raised. So it will be almost a billion hryvnas now, I think. Over a billion, actually. That's a new thing. So uh, this is the biggest Czech uh, fundraiser. And yeah, we are supporting them, at least by sending them our own money. And that's where the T-shirt comes from. And the last thing I wanted to show is, yes, uh, I am part of this uh, of this NAFO or NAFO. I still, still, still don't know. Which which is which would be the correct pronunciation? Uh, Nafo, yeah, okay, no. it, probably it, yes. It, is it Nafo? Then it's Nafo, and yeah, we have some some. You can see some pictures of the demonstrations. It was one of the first one uh, I went to, and yeah, we not only do demonstrations, we all also deliver uh, deliver. Like we, we have our own fundraiser. Uh, oh, this is me actually. <laughs> uh, we have our own own fundraiser. Uh, no. Yes. Yeah, our own fundraiser where we support this uh Peru. Perši mobilní špital, and we fundraised for a portable X-ray machine. Now we are, uh, yes, and several of of this is a portable defibrillator and a ventilator. And these guys, these guys are really cool. They they have like sixty vehicles. They, it's a volunteering mobile hospital, which operates very close to the front lines. Uh, they 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 work in already since 2014, and they have like 60, 60, 60 vehicles, and out of those, I think about ten are like fully equipped ambulances, and this this they they need these these special mobile um, equipment like the, this X ray or or the ventilator, so that they can they can fix the soldiers already. On their way to the hospital, and yes, uh, now we uh, in total we 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 donated about two and a half million Czech crowns. Yes, so ah, uh, just oh okay, so four and a half million hryvnas is from the uh is from this Czech NAFO group group which I am part of and last thing about this Czech NAFO group uh not only we do the fundraisers but like uh like I said we also do those demonstrations so this is a report from one of the Better demonstrations where we actually surprised the uh, surprised the, the Czech pro-Russian forces uh, and managed to put this uh, this Ukrainian flag on 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 helium balloons uh, like right behind their stage, so they really couldn't use most of their pictures because like any time they would take a picture of the stage there would be this ukrainian flag behind them and uh, like this is uh, there, there was like uh, i don't know 20 of us because it was kind of uh, not illegal but but uh, but they reserved the whole the whole place for themselves so we we found a special legal loophole so so that we could be there but yeah i mean those people pretend they are there for czech republic you know we are fighting against poverty in czech republic to them that means oh it's the ukrainians who are taking our money which is complete nonsense 
uh, because like, like I mean now the Czech Republic gets uh, on the tax returns from the Ukrainian refugees who found jobs in Czech Republic we are now getting more than what we spent on the support for the Ukrainian refugees who for example cannot work it's like women with children or whatever but like so so their arguments make no sense but uh, if you probably understand since those are pro russian forces their arguments are very similar to the russian arguments which also don't make any sense yeah so they pretend they are there for for czech republic but and that they have nothing in common with with the russians but for some reason the ukrainian flag triggers them a lot and then of course in the crowd you will find people like this yeah the serbian flag and this russian imperial flag oh, no 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 we have nothing to do with the russians like come on <laughs> Who's who's stupid, like me or them? Yeah. So. Oh, oh my God! And now I cannot close it. I don't know why. Really, the worst place where where, where the computer can freeze. Okay. So yeah, I mean, in in that thread, there's like some you other. Pocket by Yeah. <laughs> So, so we put those like petition stands in front of them. You you see the flag here. The, this is the big Ukraine uh, flag on on the Czech National Museum. And uh, a year ago, just before I went here, there was this big demonstration when there was like twenty thousand of those angry pro Russian uh, pro Russian Czech nationals who decided that will, they will tear down the uh, the Ukrainian flag from the National Museum. We were in front of the museum, like literally standing in front of the museum. Fortunately, when when they really went to attack the museum, the police took us out and handled it, handled it by themselves. And yeah, since then we're like doing those counter protests like this, and just um uh yeah, this <laughs> we also do some funny counter protests in front of the Russian embassy in Prague. So for example, this was when when they well they had those like pretend election. So from our friends we got some pieces of the dead Russian soldiers. Those are like Russian uh, <laughs> um helmets and yeah and, and of course the, the sharks are the creation of our ukrainian friends and we put like we put them on the stand like this like to explain who they were uh, is it, uh i don't know if you can read it yeah is it, is it clear enough i see there are some documents yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like this is what what we are given by our friends. Like, who, who, who it's all from like actual dead Russian soldiers. So, and and we knew where where they where they were killed. So this one's from Kherson, Bakhmut, Kiev, and Bakhmut again. And it just says something like "Ya bil ruskim status dvisky." My posledný odpusk and uh, the place where <laughs> the, place, uh, the, the city and the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like we had this small exhibition <laughs> of the dead Russians and and on the other side, on the other side of the road. Also, so this is us and no, 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 no. here, here. Yeah, okay, it's a video. I don't know. Probably not. But yeah, you, 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 you see the you see the line. So those are Russians who came to to vote. All the Czech Russians because they had to go to the single Russian embassy. Uh yeah. I, I I I can tell later. You know, a lot of them say, "Oh no, I'm not here to vote for Putin. I'm here for vote for, for Navalny." But you know, you know that guy's dead, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's our way of protesting. 
to vote for a non-existent candidate. Like to, to make a huge line for, for, for elections in front of the embassy. Like I, I don't really understand how well in, in their minds it's a, it's a protest. So yeah. So uh that's that's about me. Uh yeah, uh those are like this is uh, like I told you the, the big big demonstration. So so it looked like this, and those people were like extremely aggressive, shouting at us that uh, I don't know we are the Nazis and we should go back to Kiev. This is funny because I'm actually from Prague, and most of them are probably not from Prague. And we were like <laughs> we we are standing like this in front of them. I mean, you see uh, here that's me. Here we have like a bunch of old ladies. He here we have like some. Like how old? Uh, those are uh, on this side. Uh, those are Ukrainian refugees. Like th this one, she's like what twenty eighteen or something like that. And on the other side, you have this angry mob of, of like uh, yeah, <laughs> the the <Czech> mix, basically. <laughs> but who would go there and shout at those like young girls and and old women because that's the only. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the only time when they're like actually heroes. Uh, so that's from some other other demonstration and our NAFO fundraising booth that we take to some uh, Ukrainian. This one, for example, was on Nezaleznosky last year, where we are selling the uh, different merch. Yeah. To, to support and uh, to support the soldiers or, or the mobile hospital and this uh, this is from uh, I don't know if if you've heard about Benjamin Tellis if that rings a bell uh, okay so we we were also organizing like uh, uh, little it was a book signing event but like with some some uh, but we also organize like mini conferences for um like pro ukrainian politicians and like this this part of the of the of the support scene our latest our uh, yeah our, our latest nafo check nafo cool uh cool thing was uh, that we actually managed to give our uh, check nafo patch to uh to the czech president to, to patch pavel mm -hmm. So somehow we 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 managed to snuck near him and and give him that as a present. Okay, so <clears throat> I think that was enough about me. And now, if you shortly can introduce yourselves, uh, and shortly if if if. <laughs> Uh, if I mean, if you don't want to, you don't have to, but uh, it'd be nice if I mean, at least if you're interested in this scientific visualization part or in the uh, multimedia art part of the workshop, because for both we are using the same technologies, but the first part is the same for, for everyone. And in the in the second part, it, it splits into two sub workshops uh, or, of course, you can attend both if you want. So. Anyone wants to start? I can start. <laughs> okay, start. <laughs> so last last time I was also on your workshop. Yeah, I'm Alexey. I work here in Kau and here are also my students from my from my course. So I'm doing uh population uh ab initializations in in the key of Academic University. And uh, uh I don't uh, work in call in 10 minutes in eleven, <laughs> so I will leave you for, for some time. Yeah, last time I uh, uh, got ill, yeah, and I didn't finish your course. And uh, yesterday, you do not believe me, I also feel myself ill, Ill, and now I also feel myself ill. <laughs> but maybe okay. I try to, to finish okay, in this time. Okay. But last time, it was really, it, it was really cool. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, uh, my name is Mikhail, or Michael, if you prefer. Um, I am first year master students here uh, of applied physics here in Kao. Uh, so uh, I uh, registered for a scientific visualization, but uh, photogrammetry is also pretty interesting. So I don't know, maybe. Okay, okay. They both for. 
Yeah. Important yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will. Uh, so, okay. Uh, with the the scientific visualization, um, you will in the end create something that looks more or less, uh, uh more, more or less like this. Different. So, 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 uh, if you have your own. If you have your own scientific data that you would like to visualize, and you have it either in form of uh, a volumetric grid, so if you have uh, some data which is on a three D grid or three D matrix, and uh, uh, you have value, some value for each of the points, then then you can make uh, something like this, and then you can work through this this thing with the VR headset. Uh, the other option is if you have data in form of uh, uh, like particle position and some some value. So if it's like you have several entities, some particles, and for each you can specify its position and whatever other number, I don't know, velocity, charge, whatever. Or it's easier to make like, a frame based, for example. Yeah. So 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 that's the, that's what what we can also visualize at the end of the workshop, and then, uh, then the the art part. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people got quite crazy with the, <laughs> with whatever they were making. Uh, no, well, yeah, it was the not uh, so. Oh, this this was a really cool one. And for the art part, um, we will use those three D scans using this. So you you, you you see this plant? I. It was much cleaner than the uh, Is it that, 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 that this was yeah? So this is actually not a three D model downloaded from the internet but scanned a real plant which the student scanned at her home uh, using a mobile app, which I will show you. So the, 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 yeah, the, the art part will be about you find some object you like. It can be a small thing, a mid-sized thing like the plant. It can be something outside, like a statue or something, like a, one of the students was uh, went to near the, near the motherland monument. And there's uh, they had those those destroyed Russian tanks around. Yeah, so he went there and and like scanned the, the those those destroyed Russian tanks. That's what we used in the in the exhibition in Prague also. Yeah, so you, you can also do stuff like this. Um, and if you attend both, then uh, yeah, then you you will see how to transform your data. Uh, or like what what you can do with this uh, 3D volumetric data. And you will also see how you can apply very similar procedures to the to the 3D scans. Oh, and then one thing we still haven't uh, advertised the, it officially, but on the 8th and 9th, uh, I would like to do an advanced version of this workshop. So for those who, who went through the first, and that will focus on uh, using the 3D uh, 3D camera streams. So what you will learn in the in the in the part where we will visualize the the 3D scans made the statics 3D scans made with the phone, uh, we will then apply it to um, Using a 3D camera and apply that to to live streams from uh, whatever you can put the camera on a robot and get that live stream or the way I do it with uh, with my colleague in Prague is that you do those multimedia installations where you put the 3D camera in your gallery and then you use the stream uh, uh, of, of directly from the gallery. So yeah, that, that that was just like that. You know what you will learn during the workshops and yeah so uh, if you want to attend both then definitely attend both thank you very much for starting to share about the position of the people of both and um, yeah, i'm on my second year by my engineering technical institute 
and uh, I'm more interested in the visualization of synthetic data. But I'm not going to come today as well because we have very boring classes, and I think this lecture and workshop will be more uh, useful for me. And okay. thank you. These are our shocks. Yeah. So I'm more about some laboratory work and science projects. And for me, it is interesting how to make it like more. Uh, to tell about it for people in a simple way, and that is the visualization of the very massive lab. Okay, uh, so we also have the uh, VR headset here, and at the end of the workshop, I, I think this time we had this idea that the final final lesson would be on, on Saturday, right? So if you come here on Saturday, you can be here really like for the a whole day, and uh, most of what I would like to do on Saturday is actually uh, set up the VR headset on, on, on this computer and then uh, then then yeah then we will watch those things in VR we, we will make like a VR work I can imagine if you do laboratory work maybe uh, yeah maybe you have some ideas how to enhance uh, laboratory work using uh, virtual reality so well, you will at least get the basics techniques of course unfortunately we have just one VR headset, so I will have to show everything VR related on this computer. Yeah, and but everything except setting up the VR headset, you will also have in your own projects on the computer. So that's like a hands-on, uh, hands-on workshop. But you will at least see how it's done, how it's set up. You will see it's not, it's not that difficult to, to do it using using. So uh, I'm Anna, uh, and I'm a bio bio biology student, uh, uh, first year of uh, master degree in the uh, Plus Research University. And yeah, I'm more interested in scientific uh, uh, visualization. And I came uh, today at 12 because uh, like I said, the, the basics is, is the same. Again, with, with the scientific visualization, uh, it's um, that's what you will learn at the end, basically. Uh, the the it's it, so you will. I mean, the, this new the, the new thing uh, in terms of scientific visualization you will learn here. It's not uh, that much of like how to process the data, etc., because that that's not part of the workshop. But if you already have processed the data in that format, I, I told you like basically how to <clears throat> how to put it in, yeah, uh, uh, how to make them, how to turn the numbers into something visual that can be used inside those unity scenes and then uh, with the with the VR headset. So. Yeah, again, you, you, might, you, you will see. The, 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 the workshop is more basically like game development workshop, which at some point, instead of making a fun game, you, you, you're making a scientific visualization that you can work the life in a game. Yeah? My name is Natalia. I am a freelance medical and scientific illustrator. So it's uh, amazing uh, possibility for me to learn something new in this field. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope you will, yeah, <laughs> you'll enjoy it. So I'm Alexi. I'm a first year master student in applied physics here at Prow also. And Originally, I was more interested in not in the scientific visualization part, but in the artwork part. But uh, I wrote the. You, know, like, you can come to whichever you want. It's, you can decide, or you can click they, they, they both if you have Interesting, but I, I don't know whether I will just. Which one I will attend, or if I will attend both, and when it comes to experimental data, I don't. I mean, uh, uh, okay. I mean, if you have some data, you can bring your own data, and, and and we can work with that. If you don't, I of course have some example uh, example data set on on which 
uh, I will show the ideas and you can then think about how to uh, how to fit your own data later. Yeah. Okay, so that that's good. We finished the introductions in 45 minutes, including my introduction. So <laughs> that's I'm I'm getting better. <laughs> And uh, I think we can we can start with uh, okay. uh, with the workshop itself. I mean, unless you have any questions. Oh, oh okay. Maybe let's discuss shortly the schedule. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 These two tracks. That's, because, uh, that's today, a good point. Uh, we'll have uh, today and tomorrow. This this will be some basics, which are same on either track. It's just uh, the basics of Unity, how to work with it, how to make uh, shaders, uh, how to program a bit, some simple stuff. And then after that, you already start applying this uh, knowledge to either visualize, visualize, visualize your data or, uh, for example, scanning objects and doing something with real objects. So that's where the split might happen. And since I, I missed part of the introductions, uh, sadly, but from some of you, I've heard that you are interested in both and also in registration. A lot of you said that you're interested in both tracks. Uh, maybe it makes sense now to realign this schedule slightly so that we, for example, uh, maybe make basics together, like we don't split it in art and science. But after that, for example, on Thursday, if you want, we make longer day and you attend, like, come at 12 if it's comfortable for you. And then we make an hour break for lunch and everything. And after that, we continue with science, for example, uh, something like that. So, so, so yeah, now we would be interested to hear feedback from you. Uh, how available are you if you can come uh, starting from 12 till uh, 7 every day? Like, what would be the best option to see? Uh, for me, tomorrow I can come here, yeah. but Thursday is. On the cold day. Yes. And Friday and Saturday. And Friday also. And on Saturday. Maybe after the uh -huh. uh, Saturday actually will be like um, mini exhibition day where you finalize your works uh, and. Uh, and share yeah. like network between each other, like see how like, who did what. So, so, like, so, and, and this will be the day when you will have the most time to play with VR and check your know, yeah. and your Yeah, it, it will also because we didn't do this do this fifth day last year, so this is like a new idea uh, where there will be I would say like more individual work. You you will be working on your projects. I will be mostly here just to help you. And to set up the VR, because at the end, like during during the workshop, each of you will create your own project, and at the end, we want to put everything together into one scene, which which you, like everybody, so that everyone can see uh, every uh, all the other other creations. Uh, we will set it up here, and yeah, have some fun with it. So. And and of course, if if you will have like some specific questions, some other ideas which we haven't covered during the uh, during the workshop, then Saturday is. I mean, you can ask any time, of course, but Saturday will be like the perfect day to like uh, focus on on your uh, your specific ideas. What about uh, the rest? What about you? <laughs> Tomorrow I can come at the same time, basically. And so the Friday I can only come to the section in the uh the start from the four p.m. And Saturday I can come uh, from, mm -hmm. from from the morning. Also. And from on Wednesday you can't, can't come even on the second half of the day because it's busy. For on that, no, on that day I can come in the first half of the day. Ah, okay. So maybe we should 
uh, make some sort of uh, voting spreadsheet where each of you like mm -hmm. write uh, which time you yeah. can use. I I'll send the link in a bit. Yeah, we will also see we'll how, how many people will come in the afternoon. Yes, yes. And, and then... for now we, we should start already. Yeah. Again, like for the basics, it really doesn't matter. It's 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 absolutely the same for both um, both parts. Then here, then here, it's it's uh, the topics are slightly different. The, there is still some overlap, but okay. and the final product is different. We need to take a different route to get there. Mm, so, should I start already? Uh, I am pretty free. Uh, uh, the lectures, uh, when you have your workshops, there aren't any lectures in it go because it's in the same place. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm free for a short time. Uh, probably the same for Alexei. Yes, me too. Yes. And, and for you? Oh, yes. Uh, you can uh, come all days, uh, all this time. All days, so uh, ah. full, full day. Full. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, mm, since you, uh, yeah. since you all have uh, Unity installed, uh, we should start with. Um, we should start with uh, the. A new project, so I will close this in this old example project, and then uh, all the unrelated stuff. Um, yeah. And we start with a new project. So uh, open the Unity Hub, which you've already learned that basically serves as a as a method of installing different versions of Unity. Uh, oh, hey, the video is not starting. The different versions of Unity, that's something you, if you work with Unity, often you will soon discover that um, there are, sometimes there are incompatibilities between the versions, etc. Et so sometimes you really need a very specific version, minor version, which because it's the only one that works with your project. Unfortunately, that's like uh, so sometimes it happens, so it's uh, good to know that it could happen. But uh, <clears throat> what we'll be doing now is uh, hopefully universal and and should work in all the new versions of Unity, starting with this some um, 2021 something. Uh, but you should have like some newer install, this this long term support uh, 2022. Uh, so those versions will be supported until the end of this year or mid 2025. Uh, so unless you need some really new features of Unity, it's always best to stick to the uh, to the LTS versions. Uh, so from Unity Hub, we start a new project. And this new project, we will be it will be a 3D project. And you see that there's several options for 3D, something like just core and then URP, HDRP. So URP and HDRP are different uh, so-called rendering pipelines. And we don't need to think about it much. I'll just say that if you start without any rendering pipeline, it's a very bare bones project and you have to import a lot of packages by yourself, uh, especially as, uh, yeah, like with the text rendering and, and lightning and, and all that stuff, while those URP and HDRP have already uh, a lot of prepared for you. And the difference between those two is that HDRP is aimed at uh, uh, powerful uh, desktops with uh, with good uh, GPUs, um, 
So if you would be doing some like triple A game, then you would probably make in, it in HDRP because uh, uh, while URP is more compatible with URP, you can also export to phones. You can also export to uh, to web uh, web applications, but it doesn't support some advanced rendering stuff like. Uh, uh, ray tracing or or, or, or or like this this stuff you use, you use in like those uh, super fancy uh, games. So we're not doing super fancy games, and uh, we like I suppose we would um, you would prefer to have an option to export, for example, to mobile devices. So we will start an uh, URP project. Um, You'll have to download the uh, URP template, and after it's downloaded, after it's downloaded. Uh, oh. What happened to you before? Uh, uh, yeah, because you didn't select desktop on the left. It will reset it. It's one driver I disabled it. That was the issue for the first time. If you yeah. So, so can I just get to the normal desktop? Will... For example, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, don't connect it to Unity Cloud and don't use Unity version control. Uh, Unic Unity Cloud is really useful if you're doing uh, making a game because it then gives you some statistics about your your game project and like payments from from your customers and and stuff like this we don't need that and version control is something that's on the other hand extremely useful so it's like git i if if you've ever do, done some programming you probably noticed git but for unity projects it is useful at the same time it's somewhat buggy and we don't really need it for this small workshop thing but if at some point you will start doing some serious project in unity then yes use uh, the version control as well uh, but not today so let's create a project after you click on create project uh, unity will download the base packages for you uh, because the template is basically just telling Unity what packages are the dependencies of your project and those dependencies have to be downloaded uh, sometimes so yeah now we will wait and uh, as you will see very often in Unity, what you're doing is you are waiting for Unity to finish some weird operation that you had absolutely no idea is necessary. And re-downloading packages is uh, something you will unfortunately see often. Uh, sometimes it will trigger, like, it, it looks like it triggers some almost randomly. You're doing something, you create whatever, some new material or some new object, and suddenly Unity decides it wants to re-download and re-import all the packages which are in your project, which can be huge. So just don't worry when it happens. Sometimes it just happens. But for hopefully the, the basic project shouldn't take that uh, that long to, to import. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Later, I will also show you how to find new packages because, of course, very often you don't want to program everything from scratch. And the good thing about Unity. Uh, compared to other similar engines is that they have a huge library of assets you can either buy or download for free. And 
it helps uh, if you want to have something developed quickly uh, th th this really helps to uh, because most of us are not working as uh, i don't know part of like a big well paid uh, team of programmers we don't have like 40 people to uh, to work on our ideas it's usually just us and maybe one or two other colleagues and then of course using pre-made stuff helps a lot and then the i mean the, there are several downsides of unity but i would say most of them uh, are important only when you really start doing those projects at scale and uh most of the time this is not our case most of the time we are on the other side of the spectrum of the uh, small teams uh, which need to uh, get something working as fast as possible and uh, for that uh, i would say unit is still still the best option even given all the all the downsides so uh, my a uh, new project went from the importing packages stage to uh, compiling scripts stage. Uh, that's something that also gets triggered a lot uh, when when you're working with Unity. Uh, and this part, how quickly this finishes, is really depends on how fast your computer is. Uh, so while compiling scripts, uh, the scripts in Unity are written in the C-sharp language. And so now I would like to ask you what experience with programming you have. So is there someone who has never done any programming before? You, you've never done any programming? Okay. Okay, so so you have beginnings of Python somehow. Yeah. Uh, Some beginnings of Python and C. Okay. C -sharp or, um, mm -hmm. Some basics of uh, C sharp, C plus plus, and some limited experience with Okay. No. Nothing at all. Nothing. Okay. So for those who are not programmers, we also let's learn some basics of programming. Uh, Incidentally, so um, about programming, there, there are two ways to program in Unity. One is programming in C Sharp, that's a compiled language. Um, and you just write scripts in that language as, uh, as uh, a normal, normal programmer. There's another way called visual scripting, where instead of writing the programming commands, you connect boxes and nodes with some uh, lines. Um, it's supposed to make programming easier and more approachable. Uh, I don't think it's the case. And I base this on my experience with teaching the basics of Unity to two kids, incidentally also uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, during some part of workshop we, we did in Germany a month ago. And this was a, according to some, and they were, I think they, they were 16 years old. Yeah. They had no prior, uh, one had some prior programming experience, the other had none. And both of them told me that they don't think that the visual scripting language helps in any way and they they thought that it just makes things more confusing whenever you do do something that's like even like a little bit sophisticated than uh, uh than your typical hello world program so um yeah i i was thinking okay with uh, since i i had this experience just a month ago thinking maybe i will change this workshop to use this visual scripting language uh, but i will not do it because i i, I yeah I, I don't think it's 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 a good way we will use visual scripting at the end when we will be programming uh, compute shaders 
And that's where it is useful because the computational language is uh, is different than regular uh, programming languages. So in that case specifically, it helps. Uh, but I don't think it helps in the in the usual scri scripting and programming. So uh, yes, you will also gain this knowledge of basics of uh, of programming specifically in C sharp and like in general um, in general like basics of programming. So uh, my project has been imported and how how about you? Yes. Done, done, done. Yes. No. Okay. How far are you? Right. <laughs> okay. Is that long? Uh, no, it, it will just take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, meanwhile, you can. Yeah, I, I will uh, explain the the user interface now. So. Yeah. So if your project has uh, has been imported, uh, you should see a window like this. So uh, we have this main Unity interface, and uh, you can um, you can change the layout of the windows uh, to if you prefer a different one, but we will not do it now. So that we have the same layout if you at some point want to try the different layouts. They are here on the uh, top right. And this, this one is the default one. And the others are uh, basically just uh, yeah, for, for, for different workflows or like different preferences. But in case you somehow lose one of the one of the tabs because you misclick somewhere and and something disappears. Oh my God! What should I do now? Uh, you can always go here, click on default layout, and get the default layout back. Um, then we we see several several tabs here. Uh, from the left, here's this hierarchy tab, and it shows something called sample scene. I can click here and see some objects in the uh, sample scene. So this is a scene is what we see here in the in in the middle middle tab. Uh, or maybe you you had also this game window open. Uh, I don't know. So, so the default has the window a game window hidden behind the scene window. So here you set up your scenes, still think about the main purpose or the original purpose of Unity is creating games. So you have like a game level or something, you put some objects in the scene and here you see your your objects and you see visually where they are. And here, uh, here you, you see a, a tree of the objects the list of the objects that are in your scene. In our empty scene, there's basically nothing except for the camera. Uh, if I click on the camera, I see here the camera is selected and here I can see uh, where it's pointing to uh, this uh, directional light, some lighting for the scene. And the global volume object is something that uh, modifies the, the rendering properties of the scene we will not we will not really need it, so we will just not touch it at all. Beside the scene window or behind it uh, is the game window. Uh, game window shows you shows you the running game. So now it's just static, doesn't show much because I don't have the game running. Uh, to run the game, uh, there's this play button at the top. So uh, if I click play, uh, now my game is running. But since we didn't do anything with the game, we don't see any special thing, stuff happening. But uh, you see that the play button is blue. 
Now, a very important thing is that if you are in the play mode, so when your play button is blue, also when it's paused, yeah, this is still, it's just like nothing will move here, but you are still in the game play mode. Yeah. So when you're in the play mode, and when the, now if I make any changes to my game, so, okay, since I have nothing in here, nothing really changes, um, but I've moved the camera. Yeah? It's still seeing the same stuff, but, uh, okay, I, I can rotate it a bit. So now something changes. Uh, if you'll be doing those modifications in play mode, and then stop, it will reset to what it was before you started the game. So just keep this in mind, because if you will do a lot of modification modifications while your game is playing, you will lose all of them when you click stop. So when modifying something, always make sure that you're not in play mode. Yeah? Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game window, which, like I said, shows you the running game. And this, so in the scene window, you prepare your scene. And in the game window, you test how, how your game is actually working. Then down here, uh, we have a tab called Project. And this shows you the files that are uh, part of your project. So. Uh, uh, most uh, there are, you see the list of folders. Mm -hmm. So there's two main folders, assets and packages. So packages are the files of packages that Unity downloads from the internet, from the central mm -hmm. package storage, or maybe you can also import the packages by hand. But in general, this is handled by Unity. And if 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 you would delete some, uh, I mean, it's not really possible to delete it from the Unity interface. But if you would delete it on on disk, then Unity would always re-download the package according to a package list, which I will show you later as well. And assets, that's what we are interested in because that's uh, what does the files that we create. So here you will have the files that you created. And here, uh, you will have the objects in the current scene. So uh, some of these objects will use the, the, the created files. But this is like a storage of, of, uh, of your resources. And this is where the resources are applied to the current scene. Uh, you see that one of the folders is actually called scenes. If you go in, you find that, that there is this file called sample scene. And yes, that's the sample scene that's actually open here. So yeah, our new files, scripts, objects, etc., will appear here. And the final uh, final tab is here on the right side. It's called Inspector. And you will notice that if when you click the objects in your hierarchy window in the scene, you get some details about the object here in the inspector. So uh, you see that if I click on light, there's something that gives me the temperature of the light, like type of the light. Uh, the global volume has a lot of, uh, a lot of different options. The camera has some options which we will explore later. So the workflow is basically uh, you either create some virtual object directly in the scene or you create or import some files which then you put mm -hmm. in the scene and then you modify the positions and other uh, other properties of all of those objects here in the scene window. Uh, some detailed properties are here in the inspector window and finally when uh, when you make your modifications, you hit play and you see the uh, you see how your scene behaves in the game window. Sometimes you will make errors when when writing the scripts. Those will then be shown here in the error console, and yeah, we'll see. 
you'll see that in in some uh, in, in section basics one or basics two slash one or basics one slash three. So uh, has uh, uh, your scene opened yet or not? Uh, is it is it an open or, or is it? Yeah, but maybe something is the task. The Yeah, but uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, I mean, just just watch what we're doing because this 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 is easy. And we can we can get you up to speed later. So the scene window. Let's start with creating a, a scene. Um, like I said, here in this hierarchy tab, you see the list of objects you have in your scene. Now the objects uh are not called that just because they are like representations of some objects but those who are programmers and have heard about object-oriented programming have you heard about object-oriented programming yeah so those objects are in fact really uh objects in the sense of of object-oriented programming you can manipulate them not only visually here but also um also uh, from your scripts or pieces of C-sharp programs. And uh, for those who know about object-oriented programming, each of these objects is uh, is a child of, of a game object uh, class. So everything in Unity is a game object. And the game objects are here. They have some special features that allow them to interact with the Unity uh, engine and the editor interface. Um, those who are not programmers, when I start speaking about classes, objects, inheritance, and whatever, uh, just don't listen. You, you can make it through the workshop without knowing any of this stuff. So uh, yes, uh, uh, those who are not programmers will enjoy this part, creating the objects visually. So you go to the hierarchy window and let's say we start with creating some simple object, a cube. I can either right click here in hierarchy or if this tab is active, I can go here to the game object menu and there's like create empty, but there's also some pre-made objects like 3D objects uh, like, for example, a cube. So let's create a 3D cube. I click cube create. And what happened was that here I have a cube. I can give it a name. So whatever, cube one. Of course, I can right click here and rename it later if I want. You've seen that it appeared here in the scene window. And it, if, if, if your game window is on the same same page, if it's not, because if you click on default, it probably hides the game window behind, you can grab the the tab and, and like put it, uh, put it here so that you can see how the game is evolving. And uh, the cube also appeared in the game window. Yeah. Um, Here in the inspector, you see the properties of the cube. You see that it has some position, rotation, and scale. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll talk about it in the next session. So no, no, no. Let's focus on the cube itself. Um, in the window, in the scene window, you have those tools on the top left uh, of the scene window. So the first tool is the view tool. Now with the view tool, if I click in the scene window, I'm moving the whole scene. I'm not manipulating any objects. Yeah? 
Uh, I can achieve the same if I have a mouse with a middle button, or if then uh, if you if you click the middle button, you can move in the scene regardless of which tool is active. So I can, for example, have this move tool and navigate through the scene by. Uh, so with the middle middle click, I'm moving. With right click, I'm so so holding the right mouse button. I can look around, and now what the what the left button is doing depends on the tool. So the first tool is the move tool, and as the name says, it will move the object. You can either move the object along the axis, so we have this green, um, green, red, and blue ax, uh, and uh, axis, and the. Uh, one thing about the coordinate system in Unity, uh, the y-axis is the uh, is like the third dimension. It it points to the top, and the surface, the the floor is uh, x and uh, x and z. So if I grab the object by one of the axes, it will restrict the movement along that one axis. Right? And you can also see what I'm doing. You can watch the uh, the coordinates to change here in this position, tra transform position. Yeah. So now I'm really moving only along the y-axis, z-axis. Yeah. There's another way uh, how to how to move an object, and that's you can restrict the movement to a plane. So. Uh, if I, for example, here inside, uh, you see that you have those little squares. So if this square is a plane which is perpendicular to the uh, red to the to the x-axis, so if I click it now, then the x-axis is fixed and doesn't change, and I'm just changing the other two. Yeah, uh, it's good to. Always think about where I want to move my object while I'm clicking on those moves, because since you're just seeing a 2D projection, if you randomly want, oh, I want my object to be here, and you just randomly click here and then like move it, like, like is it really where you want it to be or not? And you, you don't really know. Yeah. So uh, if you make a lot of modifications that move your object somewhere where you don't want it, you can also directly uh, directly modify the position here. So if I put zero zero zero, I get it back to the center where it was at the beginning, and I can move it again with like thinking about where I actually want it to be. So the other tool is rotation. Uh, rotation again. Uh, you can watch here how 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 it changes. Rotation only has like three axes of rotation, so I grab any of them and rotate the object like this. Uh, the one thing about the rotation tool you should know is that uh, if you uh, don't try to like copy the uh, um, copy the circle because it doesn't work that way. The way it works is you hold your mouse button and then you move up or down on the screen and it just makes the rotation continue. While are you doing this, you can actually cross from, you can cross the screen, like you can just go up indefinitely. Yeah? And this up and down movement is for all of the axes. Uh, it, it can be up and down or or left or right, yeah. But it's always like one side. Uh, one side is plus, the other is minus, and regardless of which axis are you trying to 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 rotate. No, no? okay. But up and down, of course, all the time. So don't try to to do the circle. It's like increase, decrease. And again, you can see the rotation here. Uh, again, you can, of course, 
reset it by directly setting it to zero. And uh, yeah. So the next tool is the scale tool and the scale tool gives you uh, the, uh, yeah, with, with the scale tool, you're changing the size of the object. So again, I can change the size on one of the, um, in the uh, by the individual axis. Sometimes I want to keep the aspect ratio of the object so I can click on the middle box and then it changes the size of all three axes uh, together, keeping the aspect ratio. Um, if I want to reset the scale, again, I can go here, give it 111. Um, very often, you know exactly what the size of the object should be. So you want to put the number directly here. Uh, and since most of the time you want the object to uh, to keep the aspect ratio, there's this button, enable constraint proportions. If you click on it and then put a number here, the number is uh, um, put like in the correct aspect ratio in all, all, all the three, uh, three parts. So if I unlink it now and make it uh, something like that, and now if I link it, uh, You, you see that it doesn't put two in all places, but like correctly scales all three axes by uh, whatever number I've put in. Uh, last thing about this interface. So yeah, we, we want to use this tool. There's also this transform tool. The transform tool combines uh, everything, all, all those three tools into one. So scale, rotation, and position. Um, yeah, some people prefer it. I find it unnecessarily confusing, but because usually I, I mean, that's going like through, through through the individual tools. But you can you can of course use this uh, use this uh, transform tool if if you prefer to have everything uh, everything on accessible immediately. Um, so the last thing is when um, rotating and moving your stuff around, you can get lost a little bit, uh, if uh, especially if, if you using this perspective uh, projection. So there's this, this, um, uh, yeah, uh, if you click here, it will orient your scene window view it doesn't modify the camera so it won't modify what you see in the game window but in the scene window you can orient it along one of the axes so so you have those perpendicular projections and so you have the top view or the side view very often you you want to, to check whether your object is in the right place if it's not like close to the camera too far away so you just go and click uh, keep clicking on, on on this axis and it like always rotates and gives you the view um, along one of the axes. And if you click the, the box in the middle, it changes between the real perspective projection and the orthogonal projection where like things are the same size, no matter how far away they are. Uh, this one is good if you want to align uh, align some stuff which is uh, like on, on different different distance from from your viewpoint, but you you want it to uh, to have it aligned precisely. Uh, so switching between orthogonal and um, perspective projection. Yeah. Okay. So now we made an object. And uh, we can add another object here. So let's uh, let's I don't know at a sphere, for example, and move it somewhere. And you can play with 
wherever you want to put your sphere. And here in the hierarchy, you, you see you, we have a cube and a sphere. And the uh, thing about this hierarchy is that it works as a tree. So you can group objects under uh, some like master objects. So if in the scene, I now have cube and a sphere and I want them to move together to, to, to represent a single object. Uh, if I right click and create an empty object, uh, I call it group, for example. And then I can select, uh, select the sphere and the cube with control or shift, or I can also grab them one by one. And if I drop them on the group, then I have this object called group, which contains the sphere and the cube. And now when I use those move and rotate tools, you see that the objects are moving together. So you can create some combined objects made out of those primitive shapes and then group them and have them behave as as a single as a single object and of course this can be nested so if i don't know you would be creating a, a robot or a human then you would give him arms and fingers and uh then the head and like the the arm will be from like those those different joints and then the whole thing will be combined into a, a monster or something. Again, uh, if I play, if I hit play now, of course nothing happens because we still have no interaction in 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 the game. We just have placed our objects here, but just that you remember that if I make any modifications while in play mode and then I stop the play mode, it will reset back to the original original setting. So that was lesson number one, actually. So we can make a short break. Uh, if, if you have any questions in, in the next part, we... Uh, yeah, now we make, I don't know, five, five, ten minutes break. Five, ten minutes. Yeah. Coffee break. Uh, you can come actually here to the and make some coffee or tea and scoopies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think we will finish uh, not at three, but slightly later, like three fifteen. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see how much time we need, but we can finish at three fifteen because yep. we started also a bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A break. Uh, 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 and I don't know so how many people will come. Uh, maybe you know, the, the maybe there is... won't be many. But I, uh, I mean, we, we, we'll so see. today you still will be here, uh, and I'll work on. This. Yeah. I, I don't remember how I had it last time. I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure where, where I ended after the first three hours. I think but it was different. Like each time, like with, with each group, it was different. Uh, but I'm pretty uh, sure that the first day you already had this uh, program, like uh, the, ele the elementary stuff with script. moving, scripting, yeah, moving uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. And... Okay. Because, right, I thought that now it will be already like next step is uh, scripting. No? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the... You created figure, you thought yeah, about... Oh, you didn't talk about mesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the camera and changing color. Oh, yeah, before before that, before yeah. scripting, you should... Ch change, yeah, 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 because that's what then is scripted. Okay, maybe maybe today we will just reach scripting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was like... And that. after scripting, it's... Variable. Yeah, maybe... Maybe that's the beginning of script yeah, yeah, and yeah. continue with more details next time. I think we usually cut on the second day. Let's see. Yeah, ideally.
ideally on the second day we should no this this is already uh, uh, this should reach vfx yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I want to ask you a few questions uh, on the work. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know. Uh, is it reasonable to try to uh, write shoulders uh, in HLSI eh, that we will be doing? Or it's pointless and... Uh, Again, like, okay, uh, you said that we will be using some visual programming to write shoulders. Yeah. Uh, is it reasonable to try uh, and uh, actually write them in HLSL or whatever you need to use? I mean, if you, if you want to, yes, of course you can. Mm, okay. Uh, so, so uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, but there won't be much support yet yeah, on that. Uh, uh, I mean, you already know? Uh, uh, not, not really. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, it will be like learning C++ from scratch. Yes. Mm -hmm, basically. Yeah. No, no, no. But, uh, C++ is actually yeah, but... the language to, to learn. Basically. No, no, no. no. The, the, the thing, the thing about about changer languages is that they, 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 they have this kind of like different approach to variables because, yeah. uh, and and like even like control structures uh, because the, the those things. Uh, live in the GPU memory, which has different different access patterns than, than mm -hmm. regular memory. And also it's always um, always processed in parallel by the stream processors. Mm -hmm. So even the whole programming model is different. And that's why the, uh, why the syntax is different. But what I will show is this uh, visual programming language for, for shaders. And yes, in theory, everything you do in that visual programming language mm -hmm. is also doable directly in in one of the shader languages. It literally compiles to the shader mm -hmm. language and then is compiled as a shader. So, I mean, I I I, I will show the this part. I will show with with the visual scripting. Uh, because it's it's the shader languages are really okay. low level. level. Mm -hmm. So so it might be. Uh, I don't remember. Doesn't it save the projects? Uh, doesn't it save this VFX yeah, effect yeah, as uh, I think it as does. Objects which you can use like that. VFX. Uh, uh, well, what? Any? Uh, no 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 no. No, no you you would need to go to. Um, Mm. I don't so, think the no, compiled no. one is yeah, this it's year. probably already. Yeah, but if you if if you if you close close and close and go to yeah, looks like just so you know, since um, go go to the project folder. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that it could have been in that VFX, but yeah, it just it's already the compiled no, stuff. So it is definitely in the compiled stuff. So ah, yeah, but I really forgot yeah, yeah pro it. probably not. But um, maybe there are plugins which are enabled to like convert the compiled stuff back into like the one of the scripting languages. But I I think it's it, it would take some extra no, it, time. It's definitely like, somehow to possible to. Wait to to open it uh, from Unity. Mm, yes, yes, because yeah, but it's again so the same the, the compiled one. Mm. Yeah, because it's okay. It's made out of. Oh, so it's actually made out of multiple, multiple files. Uh -huh. yeah. it actually and like files. this is this is. Uh, that's, uh, this is one of them. Um, it has like well, a thousand lines. <laughs> for what? For which one? Uh, that's it. This particle effect. So, 
Uh, it, so the, this is just the thing which spawns particles. It's not to be. It's not too difficult. It's just randomly generates yeah. particles and make them spawn and get yes. destroyed yeah. in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it would take like if you wanted to write something like that manually, for example, in Python or C, it would take you like fifty lines of code or maybe one hundred. And here and this is yeah. like the graph. It's not too big. It's not too bad. But as you see in scripting language uh, for shaders, it's 1,000 lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from my understanding, I never did shader programming like in shader language. But my understanding was that it has some element elements uh, similar to assembler, where you like need to exactly say that this part of memory you need to do this, 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 this operation like yeah. that. So there are a lot of low level things. Correct it, me. It, 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 no, no, it's it basically really like low low level C. So mm -hmm. for the basic stuff, it's not difficult, but really, again, depends on what you want to do with it. Yeah. Okay. But I guess if you want, you can just uh, tweak uh, stuff. When you, uh, when you get bored with this visual stuff, you can open yeah. the, the files uh, in the folder in the assets and then like start playing with those numbers or like mm -hmm. copy and paste and I don't know, add in something. Uh, but I wouldn't, recommend, I wouldn't recommend like uh, writing yeah. from scratch. Uh, okay. Uh, there's, okay, another thing is that you have two, uh, two shader lang visual shader languages here. Basically one is this VFX graph, which I will show, and the other is called shader graph. So the VFX graph is, uh, so there is uh, different types of shaders, like we have vertex shaders, geometric shaders, fragment shaders, and complete shaders. Pixel and or, um, hmm? pixel or pixel are pixel. Uh, I think it's like vertex shader. No, no. no. Uh, but sure. th th those Maybe. different, most of those shaders, except for the complete shaders, are just purely manipulating the uh, the texture and. Uh, and vertex memory mm -hmm. and turns the the whatever you have in the texture memory and whatever you, you have in the vertex memory so somehow transforms it to be a output with like some transformations so so that you uh, you somehow see that thing on on screen yeah that's the original purpose of the shaders with the modern GPUs, you have compute shaders, which can basically run arbitrary algorithm on top of that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's very difficult to program. And that's why the, and the VFX graph is basically exactly about this. So in, in I, I will show it later, but you have this kind of, um, so from here to here, the, those are like the normal, the old classic shaders, we just manipulate what you see, uh, like directly. Yeah. But on the side of the, the graph, then we will put the algorithms that manipulate the the inputs and outputs of of, of, of this main pipeline. You are and already that, showing the. Oh, uh, not really. So, 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 what we will be doing here is is programming the compute shaders that that uh, affect the pipeline. And like I said, it's not uh, this, this is not exactly trivial to do in the shader language, but there's another variant of graph which is actually called a shader graph. And that's that's more focused on on the on the visual shaders, so it doesn't have it doesn't have the compute shaders. That's the only difference between the VFX graph and the shader graph. And um The nice thing about shader graph is that, uh, again, it's it's a visual scripting visual scripting language for shaders, but you always have this live preview where um, if you if you modify the shader, you see you see the result in mm -hmm. in, in real time, and if if it's like longer. If it's like a longer graph, then then you can somehow. Oh. Yeah, okay. I have some problem with the uh, with the drivers. That's also why it's showing yeah, yeah. this. It shouldn't be. A bit, shouldn't uh, be like this. Looks like with artifacts. 
Yeah, it was. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I can can uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. like in in the shader graph, then 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 at each node, you you actually see the result of of that operation. And this shader graph, when exported to uh, to the uh, to the shader source code, is quite understandable. Mm -hmm. So if, but also it's somehow mm -hmm. limited uh, because it doesn't support the compute shaders. Mm -hmm. You can play with that if if you want to learn shader programming. I uh, I would say starting with uh, this shader graph language is a good option. By the way, the Kijiro packs uh, was he making them all like stressed in Unity mostly, like with visual uh, visual yeah, programming, yeah, yeah. or was he writing him from scratch? Because like, I believe that he was using it. Oh, he was using only the visual. Uh, yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. Mo mostly, mo mostly, he's only only doing the the VFX graph. Stuff. It will be uh, like easy. We'll talk about that probably tomorrow. But K zero is basically like uh, one of the biggest probably guys in Unity scene who is yeah. making like. Uh, tons of different effects, tons of different uh, shader effects, uh, and on his GitHub, he basically has this like uh, these repositories where like uh, uh, the third of January, the fourth of January, the fifth of January, and each has like five ten effects, and yeah. So he like does a lot of that stuff, and since he obviously is an expert in that and is very good in that. If he uses visual language, then there might be reasons for that, <laughs> for Unity at least. Of course, in uh, Unreal Engine, in other, in other engines, it uh, probably has different pipelines. And I don't know if, uh, pr probably Unreal, I, I didn't work with Unreal Engine, probably it has some plugin to like yeah, uh, yeah, compensate yeah. for that, but the, there the, are visual visual more, sh shader languages in, uh, in Unreal as well. Right. Yeah, but yeah. I know that uh, Unreal Engine is like more hardcore, like it's yeah. it has C plus plus, it has more coding. I would uh, suspect that it relies more on like programming uh, shaders also from scratch. No, no. It's, it's, it's also, it's also it's done. Just, yeah, yeah, everyone yeah, does it usually yeah. nowadays. Okay. Well, I don't know if everyone, but I, 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 I don't <laughs> mean uh, like some yeah. uh, very like my, my minorities who like do it uh, like some effect for yeah. years, and then it's super cool, but it's only one effect, and they could yeah. have made one from. I, I mean, probably if if you work in on Unreal itself, then uh, if you if you need to optimize some shader or whatever, you won't write that shader from scratch yeah but you will tell the team that's working on the visual shaders that they should yeah. make this path optimized so so and, and 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 in between you have you have people who yes try to program their shaders mm. from scratch but then 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 they probably missing out on a lot of optimizations that that are provided by the engine and people who use just the engine and for them nowadays makes less and less sense to uh, to write the shaders directly, also because the 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 and there are modern so many shaders that's already and, and, and the shaders they do a lot of things like mm -hmm. well, like like if if uh, like if 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 you want a good looking game then you're probably not using basic shaders program yeah, yeah but, but but of course like you you might want to do something special some some special effect somehow transforming. The idea you had, like then, then it makes sense, of course. But uh, if you're going for good-looking visuals, then then you probably download some existing stuff. Do anyway. so, <laughs> you want to have at least a yeah. question? So what? No, no, no. no we, we we can continue. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> oh, nice. No, oh, I, I have this as well. <laughs> I, I bought them. Nice. <laughs> I think I got them in a whiff when I was there last time. Yeah. Wait, wait. I, I, yeah, I, I have these two. Then there's this uh, Burning Moscow socks and... We also have the Nafofela, uh, Nafofela socks.
Oh, we should already start. I know it was she went. Oh, uh, we can wait a bit. Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks. Oh. So, let's continue. Uh, you have the, um, yeah, so now, now, now you know how to move the objects in the scene. You know that when you click on the object, there's this inspector window that shows you some detailed information about that specific object. And you've already seen that one of those information is this um, position rotation scale, which is part of the, here it's grouped under transform. So what it is actually, what all, all the stuff that we see here. So as I said, these are uh, these are the objects and um, mm, the programmers have heard that the objects are like children of some sort of game object. And here, when you select an object, what, what we see here is the list of uh, so-called components. And components are different scripts that can be attached to a game object. And because you have, we also have this empty game object that has no components except for the transform. Each game object has a transform, but the transform is just this position, rotation, and scale. And if, if, if a game object is, for example, a sphere, that that the game object represents a sphere is uh, is defined by some other other components that are attached to the object. So let's uh, explore, for example, the camera first. So if you click on the main camera, you again see that yes, of course, it has a transform because it's a game object. And then there's this component called camera. If I turn it off, uh, okay. If I turn it off, then uh, my camera object has lost the camera, so it won't do the rendering. And um, each of the components have a bunch of properties of the specific component. So for example, for the camera, uh, what we can, if, oh, wait, 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 yeah, yeah. You see here, you have this environment section uh, under the camera component, which tells you what's the background type. The background type now is skybox. Uh, you can also change the component, the, the type to like some color. So you can have a, Uh, that that affects the background of what's displayed in the camera. You see that it makes no changes to the scene, yeah, to the scene window because the scene window is just something that uh, prepares your scene, and you can have multiple cameras with different backgrounds. For example, the skybox you can also choose your own. We, uh, if you want your own skybox, so the skybox here is a picture basically. So you can have your own picture, which actually could represent like some real piece of sky or something. Uh, I can show you later how to do that. That's, it's one way to customize your scene, especially if you be doing the art track later. So now I don't know. Let's 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 put solid color, for example. I mean, for scientific visualization, you probably want your background to be either black or white, usually. Huh? Uh, but really it depends on what you're doing, but most of the time it's like that. Uh, so if we go to some other object, let's say the cube. Uh, now, if you look at the cube, there is a, something called a mesh filter and a mesh renderer. Uh, so those components define uh, the, the mesh. The mesh itself is... Uh, 
definition of the shape of your object. If it's a, an object that has a shape, and it's like a 3D, yeah, a 3D mesh. So here I can change the mesh from some predefined meshes or imported meshes. Uh, I can change it from cube to capsule or make it another sphere or turn it back to cube. So this, the mesh filter defines the shape and then there's the mesh renderer and mesh renderer tells you how the object is rendered. So it defines the look of the object. Uh, if I turn it off, then my object disappears because now I'm not rendering it at all. Uh, but here, for example, I can change the material of the object. So an object that is visible has a mesh filter, which defines like the abstract shape of the object. A renderer, which defines how the object is rendered to the screen, so the look of the object. And the renderer has several properties. And one of the most important one is the material. The material defines, again, the look of the object, but as, as in, uh, yes, what material is, is it made of? So, for example, if you would like to change the color of the object, what we will change is the color of the material. Now, if I click, either uh, here, if I double click here, you see that my, here in the inspector, I have something called materials. There's some default material and it has some properties, but I cannot click on any of them. And the reason is that this material comes from one of the packages. You see that, uh, that Unity opened this packages folder for me. And the packages are downloaded from the internet, from some package repository, and you can't really change them for a good reason, because Unity is always free to re-download the packages and replace, it would replace your changes with some defaults. So if you want to change the color of your object or whatever, you have to create your own material and apply the material to the mesh renderer of the object. So how to apply, uh, how to create a material? We go to assets because a material will, will be a file. It's it's material definition of file that then can be applied to multiple objects. So I right click here and go to create uh, create material. Uh, I don't know. I call it yellow material, and then I'll try to make it yellow somehow. So. Uh, you can also, instead of right clicking and and finding it in this create, you can also find it here in assets create material. Yeah. So if I click on the material, it again opens the inspector and um, there's several different parameters of the material. What we will be interested in is this so-called base map and if I click this part of the base map, I can choose the color of my material. I said yellow, so it will be yellow. Now you see that the preview of the material is yellow. You can also change how it reacts to light through this metallicity. So a highly metallic, Highly smooth object is uh, more like a mirror, basically. And low metallicity gives like um, more diffuse reflection of the light. And similar with uh, smoothness. Um, another Another option is that you can use a texture for the base map. So instead of having a single color, if you have a picture that you have you want to have applied on the on the object, you can drop a picture here to the base map. Uh, again, we can play with that later. 
Uh, now I have a material and I can, I want to apply it to the object. So one of the uh, one of the ways to do that is I can actually drag the material and drop it on the object, just like this. And of course, I can select the object and go to its mesh renderer, find the material here. If I click on this little uh, little circle target, uh, it will give me a list of all materials in my project. So most of them are coming from the uh, some default packages, but uh, I can also find my custom material and and yeah, have it have it applied here. Um, now of, of course I didn't change much in the in our material, so it's relatively simple to create a new one. Of course, if 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 you have some uh, very special material with many different options you've changed, and you want to make a copy, then uh, here. You, if you want to make a duplicate of your asset, a copy of the file, you won't find this option any anywhere in those menus. Uh, but there's a shortcut, Control D, and if you press Control D, you will get a second one with like the number appended to the file name. But, but I think it was also somewhere in the menu. Maybe no, it's not. It's only main. for for the game objects. If I want to duplicate a game object, so for example, if I want to make a duplicate of that, I can right click here, here, and there's duplicate yeah. here. Yeah, and now I have. I mean, they have both the same position, but you see, of course, that if I move this one away, away yeah. uh, it's a second one. Yeah, and Control D works as well, but it doesn't. The menu is not. No, no, but if you click on the hierarchy, I thought it was also du the duplicate was available in the hierarchy, but not in the asset, not in assets. If you click on one object, not on the group. Hmm? If you click on one object, not on the group, doesn't it still work? May yes. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, here, that, not that, here. That yeah, not here. Yeah, 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 but but not here. So if if I if I want to go for more multi. Oh, no, no. I mean, like, why not? But that's not what I wanted, actually. Uh, red material. Um, so it's like if if you really want to make some easy again, Control D. But if just the thing is that if if you do it here, always check. And so, so if I now, now uh, I don't know on a black one, just make sure that you're renaming the the, the correct the correct object. Yeah, and here now you made the German one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like so, sometimes what I'm about to do is quite predictable, right? <laughs> Oh, here we are. Another thing so the lightning, yeah. Remember, that's one of the easier, easier things to play with. Uh, the light temperature, which gives you the scale from orange, orange yellow light to like hot light to to very cold blue light, or like something in the middle, and. Uh, what we have now here is directional light, and that means that it's um, parallel rays of light. 
So for example, you will notice if I'm moving the light, nothing changes because this is just like one vector which defines direction. Uh, if I start to turn the light around, now, now I see some changes from where the light is actually shining. So yeah, moving doesn't do anything for the direction light, rotating uh, rotation changes things. Uh, there are other light types. So, for example, let's create let's create a point light. So we have point light that, that that's a point source of lightning. A spotlight is um, like like a uh, like a light bulb with with like directionality, like a cone of light. Uh, so let's, for example, add a point light somewhere uh, position it try to position that I don't know why uh, in the middle of this but of course if you didn't do it like like me there's like no problem just just put the point line somewhere that, that, that you can actually see that it's it's illuminated illuminating something uh, you can change its range, like beyond the range, it doesn't do anything. So now, now it's not really shining on my objects. If I just do one, you, you see the range in the scene window. It shows you where, how far the light will reach. And of course, with the increasing multi uh, intensity, uh, yeah, we increase the intensity of the light. Uh, another nice thing here is that um, in those, uh, if you want to modify those properties, you don't need to input the uh, number directly. You can also click next to the number, like to the left of, of it. And then just by holding holding the button and dragging the mouse, uh, you change the value uh, that's that's defined here. Yeah, so if, if, if you click here, then you can just drag to change the value. So that's another uh, way to manipulate the uh, the values and objects in in the in the editor. Okay, so um, okay, nah. we can now move to scripting. But I was thinking maybe. Maybe, maybe we can we can also try some pictures and just this Oh, okay. One of the actually usable. Yeah, yeah. So this is a picture I downloaded last year. <laughs> it's still here. It's cool. So if you want a picture for a texture, I think there were also bricks somewhere and other textures. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that, that's the first one I, I've downloaded. <laughs> so you find your picture or download it on or from the internet or whatever, and very easily grab the picture to the assets. Uh, of the project, it will appear here, and it's automatically converted to a texture. So if I click on the imported picture, it has some texture properties so, uh, here. Uh, if I want to put my picture on some object, so maybe I create a new object, a cube, mm -hmm. Put it somewhere so I can see it, uh, like here. Now, you see how, how how suddenly it can become like really confusing because I, I don't know like where's my camera facing and whether I'm moving my object in f closer to the camera or further away. That's that's when this will become very useful. And again, if I want to. 
put the texture on the object. What I can do is create a new material and apply the texture to the material. And of course, there's a shortcut to do all that at once. And that's, I can grab the texture and drop it directly on, on the object. And then Unity will automatically create a folder called materials. And inside that folder, there's this material which already has this texture applied. So here you see this. If I click on base map, on the picture next to base map, it will uh, it will show me this this picture that I that I imported as uh, as a texture. Yeah. That's a cool thing. So if if you import other pictures and like drop them on your other objects, it will of course put them on the um, here in the materials folder as new materials. So what I can do, since Unity already made the materials folder for me, I can, for example, move all my materials into that folder. Good thing is, if I do it in Unity interface, it remembers where the materials original were. So you see that I've moved them into a subfolder, but they, they didn't disappear here. They're still connected to my objects. If you would do that, of course, outside Unity, if you would really move the files in like File Explorer, then this connection would be lost. Yeah, I think that's like about all I wanted to show about the visual environment, because now you need, you have all the, all the necessary basics. And we can move to scripting because so far, we made yeah a lot of changes here and there, but if I hit my play button, nothing happens because our game is still just some static uh, assortment of objects on the screen. Can you please once again show how do you uh, import texture? Oh, uh, you find your file, download your file, whatever. Uh, so, so there's some picture JPEG. Yeah, you just drag and drop it. Ah, okay, yeah. you can also in, in materials. just drag and drop it into assets. Ah, into assets. Okay. Yeah, you. you can also right click import. Oh, yes, of course, of course, of course. You can also go to assets, import new assets, and then find find the file. Yeah. So now I have some bricks, so I can create a... Well, actually, I can use the bricks tomorrow. So... If there are no questions, we can move to the basics of scripting. So scripting, uh, since most of you are not programmers, uh, I will, uh, uh, we will all do the same thing. So um, scripts are written in the C-sharp language. And to create a new script, there are several options how to do that. Oh, okay, scripts are pieces of program that will manipulate our game object. So somehow they are modifying the properties of the objects and telling the objects what to do. They can also react to user input, to um, whatever key presses, mouse movements, uh, uh, and stuff like this. To create a new script, again, I have uh, several options. A script is a text file. Uh, so it will appear here in the assets as a file with uh, some uh, specific extension. So I can create a new script by right clicking here and going to create C sharp script. Uh, now, the important first important thing is right click where. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 
So right click anywhere in, in, in assets, or again, you can you can just go to assets, create C sharp script. Yeah. Now the first important thing is you have to give your script a name, and that name has to be unique. So you cannot have two scripts with the same name in your project. Yeah. Um so the first okay, the first script we will create will um will change the color of some of the objects we have uh, on uh, the user pressing a key. Yeah? So the thing, yeah, the important thing, since you need to, to name the script now, you can change the name later, but it has some issues, which I will show you. Uh, you. You have to give it some name that is understandable and somehow that you know what the script is going to be doing later. So here I called it key press color or something like key color or I've chosen this one. You can you can choose your own name. The thing, while it's important, uh, yeah, why you should preferably do it like this, is that after I create the script, if I double click it, ah, okay. Uh, again, an important thing. We uh, lost your code. If you have one, you use code. Okay. It's fast. Okay. So if you double click your script, it should open one of the script editors you have. Uh, so by default, uh, by default, you should have, uh, by default, it installs uh, the community version of Visual Studio. Uh, you can also connect it to some different. Uh, so, so this is not the default, but if you double click, uh, if you double click the script, uh, it should open some default for you. Hopefully, it's not Notepad. Yeah, what <laughs> something. That's like what, 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 what open for you? So, so that, that I, I know. That, that you have now. Not Notepad. Can you scroll? Yeah. Down? Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Let me download. Yeah. No, 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 no. If uh, okay, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, okay, okay. So if uh, if because yeah, uh, the default installation of Unity should give you Visual Studio as well. If it didn't, then uh, download Visual Studio code. Hmm. Code. Download and install Visual Studio Code, and then then make uh, make make Unity open the files in Visual Studio Code. Yeah, I, I just so you have something, or you install in code, or I just install Visual Studio Code. You have it. Okay. It yes. So 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 now. Uh, just to, uh, you know, which you provide, I think, if you, if you already have it, yeah, we have it, no, I don't know, download it and install it, okay. Ah, that's the It does faster than, uh, the yes, and they don't need, like, extra, yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, I mean, of course, for programmers, there's also connection to uh, JetBrains Rider. If you use JetBrains, then uh, Rider is the C sharp thing and works pretty well. And I will just make here some remark that for the next workshop, I should also put specific. Extra information about extra information about about installing Visual Studio Code because I, I don't know maybe it's not the case. Visual Studio itself. Yeah, yeah, 
it, maybe, it, maybe they changed it to New York Health Care. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, when, just... I was, when I was a patient uh, pension, uh -huh. uh, I think <clears throat> I think I didn't see it there. Yeah. Mm. They, they probably changed it. Uh, if it don't work, it's all right. It does install it as a problem. Uh, you can go to check. Uh, yeah, you can you can save all the default uh, settings. It has. I mean, if you want, you can add uh, shortcuts in the question. So you can do that. Then. And after it installs, when you double click in uh, Unity, hopefully it will show you an option of uh, this little code. Mm -hmm. So everyone can open. With the SDKs, and you don't actually need all that stuff, but everyone can open the, the script file in already or not. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, no. Not yet. Uh, you open it like mm -hmm. the and it opens. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. So. And then you can install that plugin as well if you want. It's not required. You can just uh, add it so that uh, you can run something from the text editor, but just go back to that step. You can see it in the top that now it's the extension that it's installing. But in the previous step, new behavior script one dot cs. No, no, higher. To the right. No, no, no. Uh, like the tab, uh, Vodka. New behavior script, uh, one, but. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, again, we created the script and gave, gave the file a name. So, in my case, I called the file Keep Less Color. Uh, and you will see that if I open the file, it actually creates this class called keypress color. Now, this is the important thing. Uh, some uh, th that the name of the file, keypress color, always has to be same as the name of the class. So if I rename the file now, I also have to rename the class inside the file. The same if I copy the file. Then I then the then I need to rename the class inside the new copy. Yeah. So something to remember with scripts, file name always has to be the same as the class name. And opening the script. So what we see here, there's this first part with those so-called using directives. This is some sort of header of the script. And you don't really need to think about it because it will always be auto-generated for you by the uh, by the Unity engine. Yeah? So whenever you start a new create a new script through the uh, Unity interface, you can forget about the header. It's just there. It does what it's supposed to do, and then you have this class name and class specification. So. Class specification always has to start with those words public class and the name of the class, uh, a colon, and after the colon, there's uh, the parent class from which this 
your class, the key press color class, derives uh, its properties. So this mono behavior is some parent class, uh, which allows your own class, this key pre color class, to interact with the Unity engine and to do the game stuff, basically. Again, for the non-programmers, uh, you can forget about all the stuff around, just like make sure you don't modify it and it stays the way it is. And for you, important part is this, the class name. Eh? Uh, so let's go inside the class. Then you see this curly braces. So whatever is in between those curly braces, the opening one, and you see, it doesn't really matter if I put it on a new line or like right here behind. The important thing is that what's inside is what's what makes up this so-called class definition. So whatever the class define with the with this name is supposed to do, you will put between those curly braces. I'm sorry, could you perhaps change the state so you don't need to see? Yeah. Uh, would... Control and uh, rotating the viewer. No. You can't make control. a bigger? Control plus. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the curly braces always denote some block of stuff that's supposed to happen or that belongs to whatever is written just be before the curly braces. It doesn't matter if they're on a new line or not. It's like always the start of the block and the end of the block. So our class, inside our class, we, we see two things, so-called functions, a start function and an update function. What the functions are doing is specified again between those curly braces after the function name. Uh, so there's nothing here, nothing here. So the functions are not doing anything now. Uh, the difference between those, uh, so so each of the mono behavior object can have different functions with special names, and this the the, the function names then define when are these functions called. So the start function is called at the start of your game. So when you start your project, whatever you put in here is uh, it, it will be executed at the start. An update is, as they say here, called once per frame. So again, we're, we're talking about a game engine, about some rendering to screen, rendering some animation, and that's being done in frames. So at each frame, at each change of what you see on the screen, before this is uh, before the the new frame is rendered to the screen, whatever you put here in the update function will uh, will happen. Yeah. So the easiest thing we can do with those functions is uh, if you go back to the uh, Unity interface, there was this console thing. So the easiest thing you can do is to write something to the console. And it's actually useful because sometimes you will be changing some numbers or modifying some stuff and you won't immediately see what's happening here. You need to do some debugging. You need to see what your program was supposed to do and why it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So you can put some information in the console. So let's... Uh, to put information in the console, we use the debugging feature and its lock function. So I say debug.lock. Now the important thing with the C sharp programming language is that it's case dependent. So you need uh, like to have a capital L and small O and G. Yeah. Then I uh, use the regular brackets and into those I put parameters for the function so what uh, what will be locked and since that parameter will be so-called string some piece of text that piece of text has to be inside double quotes 
and at the end of the line, I need to put a semicolon. So this, this is what comprises the syntax of the function call of the C-sharp language. Uh, so I wanted to play, print a string instead of hello world, which is a typical string. Uh, this is the one I uh, like to present on the workshops here. So again, uh, make sure that the capital letters are correct in the function call, that you have the brackets here, that your text is inside the double quotes and that you have a semicolon at the end of the line. If you save this with like file save or control S and then you go back to your Unity project, the, uh, okay, just let me know if everyone has has this somehow. Yes, 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 yes. So if you go back to the Unity project, you, you should at least briefly see this compiling scripts part. Yeah. So Unity detects whenever you change your script, be it in the editor, like anyhow outside Unity. And when it sees the change of the script, it will recompile the project. Now, if you open the console tab and hit play here, you either get an error, in that case, let me know, or, oh, oh, and nothing happens, of course. So if you get an error, then now at this point, it's because uh, you have some syntax error in the script. So anyone has an error? No, great. So, but nothing happens, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's because we need to, the script exists, but we need to attach it to some object so it actually is doing something. So find any active object in your game. Uh, so I can, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll drag it and drag it here, for example. Again, you can drag it to the cube. Now, if I click on my cube, you see that down here, I have this new component, this keypress color script. Yeah, another option, I can here click this and remove the component. Another option is I first select one of the objects and down in the inspector, I click on add component. And here is a search, uh, search bar. So I start typing the name of the script. And it, it it will show me my script. Yeah. Another option still would be again. I I can remove the component, and like if 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 I'm not writing anything here, I can just like find it, uh, find it somewhere in the menu. Yeah? So the script. And those are some scripts which are coming from the default Unity packages. And here is at the top is my new script. Yeah. So you add in any of those ways, drag and drop or select from add component, you add the script to your object. And now if you hit play, you should see the debug message in the, in the console window. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. No. So go to project and uh, you have the script. That's fine. And did did, did you uh, where where did you want to put it? Did you put the script on on, on one of the objects? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, you, you can drag and drop it or. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it, it didn't, it, if you click on the cube now, you'll see it, it wasn't added there because you dropped it on. I mean, you need to drop it on the on the board. It's but go go there, do it again. Yeah, and now it won't work. Now it will. Yeah. So now if you hit play, now yeah, scroll down and, and you have it there three times actually. So hit play. Oh, you, you, 
Let me now look at the console. And there will be probably three messages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't want those extra messages, I'll press play again. So everyone? And no. check the queue and scroll down for its property. And just remove the unneeded ones. So so because you have three times, yeah, you can just. Uh, yeah. Uh, ah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a yeah. Okay. So this is uh, now we had our our message in the in the okay. So again, don't forget exit the play mode before making any further modifications. And now if I go back to the project, I uh, edit the script and let's see what the update function is doing. So I can copy this whole line, select control C, control V and uh, if I do this, what will happen in, in the debug log? I will see Slava Ukraine once because that was run at the start of the game in the start function. And then whatever, million times repeated Haram Slava from the update function because that is triggered on every frame change. Yeah. So if I make the modification like this, again, uh, go back. I mean, you don't have to write the whole thing, right? You can just like copy the line and paste it here. The so control C, control V programming is the most efficient way of programming, of course. <laughs> now it's being slowly replaced by ChatGPT programming. But even with ChatGPT, you do control C and control V a lot. Well, since they have the copy button, you just click on it. <laughs> <laughs> Not even control C these days. It's true. <laughs> so, again, I go back to Unity. It recompiles. I open the console. Now, uh, this is from the previous run. If you want to make sure that you're not seeing the the messages from from the last time you run it, you you have the clear button here. That's also a very useful one. So now my console is clear and I hit play. And you see this was being run once. And this, since is this the same message repeated over and over again, uh, Unity just groups it into one and just here tells me how how many times it has been triggered. Yeah. No, uh, I, I mean, wait, I think if, if you really, really want to. So here's this uh, button collapse. Which it does exactly that collapses. If you click on uncollapse, then uh, here it tells you we emitted more than a thousand messages. So again, I can hit clear, run, and if if collapse is not active, then yeah, it will just like put new new ones here. But if I click collapse. They will be hidden under single message with the number of how many times this message has been repeated. Okay. Works for everyone? Yes, yes, no. Okay. So now I stop the game again. 
Тому що коли те, що написала старт, це воно один раз припустить, а те, що апдейт, воно буде оновлюватися на кожному новому екрані. Тобто воно буде постійно так там спамити і зупинитися тільки тоді, коли ми зупинимо. This uh, you usually don't want to have some debug message repeated in each frame. So uh, if you don't want to delete the line, but keep it for later, because maybe you will want to use it, you can comment it out. And you've seen like this, these, uh, these parts of code are actually comments. Comments are pieces of text that don't do anything, but maybe explain what your code is doing. Or if there's something you want to temporarily disable, uh, you you put the two slashes in front of it, and now it's oh, again only only the first one will do something. So um, now let's move to some in basic interactivity. Uh, and we will read the keyboard and wait for some press of a button. And when the user presses a button, we will change the color of uh, something, some object. Yeah. So for the very start, how to change the color of an object? Uh, go choose one of the objects. Um, Uh, okay, one of the objects. The, the, find the object where, where you have your script. If you forgot which object it was, you can click on your script, right click on your script and uh, find references in scene. And here it will filter uh, only the objects that have this script attached. So in my case, it was this cube. So I find my cube and I can disable this filter. So I again see all, all, all the, the whole is here, but I know that my script is here, yeah? So uh, if I want to change the color of the things, I need to change the material of the thing, yeah? Or not exactly change the the, the whole material, but I want to change this property of the, of the material. That's that's its color. Yeah? Even if you have a texture there, you can you can change the base uh, the base color. Uh, so that's yeah. So what I will changing is some property of the material. The material itself is a property um, uh, is a property of the objects. Uh, mesh render, yeah. So I will need to get the renderer. On the renderer, I will need to get the material, and on the material, I will have to change the color. And this is where this object-oriented programming comes in. So if I'm modifying a script which is directly attached to an object, uh, what first thing I want to do is to uh, select the correct component. Yeah. So again, those are objects, and here are the components of one object. A mesh renderer is one of the components, and here it's called mesh renderer, but the name in a script is just renderer. So let's put it here at the beginning. Uh, so I want to get the component, which is called renderer. It's of type renderer. For that, I have a function called get component. Again, uh, capital G, capital C, no spaces. Get component. And now the type of the component I want to get has to be put inside angle brackets. So get component and the type, the name of the component is called renderer. 
So in angle brackets like this. So I want to get component of type renderer. This is actually a function call with no additional function parameters. This is so-called template parameter, but function parameters are not there. So uh, like just put the empty, uh, empty regular uh, parentheses here. So this gives me the object's render, and now I will be accessing the the uh, the property of that uh, of of the render. So I want to change. I want to find its material and change its color. So I get the material. I dot material, and to change its color, I dot color so a little bit about programming what this statement does is it goes to my object finds the renderer finds the material and finds the color so basically this is like a finger pointing at the color of of, of the material now I either can read from it, and, and, and remember what the color is now, or I can change it. So for that, uh, if I'm uh, changing something, I say that the color equals something, Co color equals red. Yeah, well, how, how, how to correctly write red, we, I'll show later. Now, now this, well, so, so I'm, I'm, I've, yeah, I've found the, color of the object and I want to assign red to that. Yeah. So, okay, how to do it? Um, I have, a, there are many ways to do it, but the easiest one now is uh, there are predefined color names. So they live in master object called color with a capital C. So color.red will make that material red. So this syntax is ugly somehow, but you'll see, see it a lot because it's the way how to select uh, mm, uh, uh, components of an object. And the a component of the object is an object in itself and to, to access named properties of any object or a component, use the dot notation, and what kind of properties this object has depends on the type. So you need to know that a renderer has a material and the material has a color. And this, of course, you will find in the documentation of the table. So material, so now if I save this, and go to my scene. If I run the game now, at the start of the game, my cube will change to red. Nothing else will happen because like, I wouldn't put anything else there, but this is, yeah. That's not much interactive yet, right? So I promise that we will change the color on pressing a key. And that means that you need to find out that a user has pressed the key. There are many ways to do it. One of them is that uh, during each frame update, because uh, yeah, every time I update the frame, before changing anything, I will look whether the user is pressing a key. So what I will do is I will, that there's a function uh, which belongs to the input uh, framework and uh, it can tell me whether the user is right now pressing a key or not. And the function is called get key down. And what it does is that it reads whether the, uh, it tells me whether the user has been pressing a key or not. And depending 
on if he was doing it or not. I need to do something. So uh, to to make a decision based on the truth value of some question, uh, there's a so-called if construct. So uh, down here. So and if looks like this. So if and now I will pose my question. If something happened or not, so if it happened, I will do something. Yeah? The question will be in the parentheses, uh, or in yeah, in the parentheses later. And what should happen if that question is true will be in the curly braces. Yeah? So now we need to fill in the question here. And what should happen if the if, if that question is true? So this is asking me if here will be, has the user pressed the key? And if yes, then we will change the color to green, for example, yeah? So first let's let's put the question in there. So I wanted to know, is the user right now pressing the G key? We will change the color to green, yeah? How to formulate that question is is input dot get key down so this get key down is again a function that tells me whether a user is pressing a specific key so i i need to say which key i'm looking for okay? and I'm looking for a key, <laughs> no, uh, key with the key code G. So this asks: Is the is the user pressing a key? Specifically, is he pressing the key G? And if he is pressing the key G. You, ha you have it there? Yeah. If he is pressing that key, then we will change the color to green. Yeah. Again, uh, I can just copy this whole line and paste it here. Just when doing it, remember, I want it to change to green, not to red. So everyone there? Yeah. 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 Save it. And if I go back to my project, it will recompile. And I have this active key G. If I run it, then yes, at the beginning, at the start of the game, my, my color changed to red. That's here in the start function, I'm changing the color of the material to red. And then if I press G, it turns green. Yeah? Ah, I If I press other stuff, nothing happens because it didn't define anything else to happen. But this should be there. And now you can uh, change this. So uh, just like copy paste this block and make it read uh, R and B and change the color to uh, red and blue. And meanwhile, I'll go around and check if the original thing works for you. So it works for you? It works for you? Yeah. Works for you? Yeah. 
So if you open the console, uh, yeah, clear it. <laughs> it's here. Uh, so it's type for namespace uh, and rather command be found. So you have a typo here. So open, open mm -hmm. it. And it even, uh, okay, then, excellent. Yeah, sorry. I uh, forgot that if you're teaching something, you need to also make errors to show what it looks like if you make an error. So, for example, if I have a typo here, go back to um, go back to Unity. You see that I I, I have uh, it tells me typo and namespace couldn't be found. If I go to the console, click here, uh, you see that I, I made the typo instead of render. I said something like render. And here it tells me in which file is the error. So key press color.cs. And this 1122 tells me the line of the error and the, uh, and the column like the Uh, the position of the of the letter where the error is. So if I open my key press color and find line eleven and character number, so I'm on line eleven and character number twenty two. So the error starts somewhere here, and it told me what the error was that. Um, that this namespace couldn't be found. So either I'm missing some library which has the uh, namespace or which is much more common, I I mistyped the name. So it tells me exactly where the error is so I can fix it. And yeah, uh, so My idea what you could do was you just copy paste the block uh, and hey, come on. And do something like this. And then you go back and you have the basic interactivity where clicking buttons changes the color of your object. So everyone got it or something similar? Yeah, and if you go to, if you save it and go to, yeah, go to back to Unity. Play. Yeah. And if you press the buttons. No, no, no. It, 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 yeah, yeah. And now press G. Yeah. And it turns in. So now you have to put the other mm -hmm. other colors in there, so 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 so, so that it uh, like this, and it should work for you.
Now that you've got the general idea, uh, you can try playing with the properties. For example, you can press on the object for which you already successfully change color in the bottom. And you can check what other properties it has, like not on the material color, but for example, position. And th that will be like separate extra task. But since you are waiting for now, you yeah. can try adding, for example, oh, I, the, I mean, uh, there is we'll extra. With uh, yeah, we, we will be yeah. finished for today, but just the general idea for you that you can, can for example, uh, you can edit all to this script, but yeah. it's better like to make yeah. stuff in different scripts so that they have different names, different logic, so that you don't create a mess. But you can like add here, for example, get component renderer. Not material, but for example, the position. You just you just check how it's called mm -hmm. in the menus, and then for example, uh, add a number to it on update, and then it will be slowly moving to the right or to the left, depending on which coordinate you change. Just giving you general ideas. It will yeah, be yeah, made yeah. later in details. Yes, yes, yes. That, that that's exactly how we will start. Uh, just so that you have the feeling in the next one. So instead of changing the color. Everything. We'll stand with changing position and rotation, so so we'll have to uh, way to influence the yeah the how the scene is composed, uh, and as you can guess that now we were manipulating the renderer, so something uh, here yeah you can still watch what. How 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 this changes like in real time in, in the inspector if I select my cube and so we were modifying the material here of the mesh render. Of course, if you want to change the position, for example, you will be modifying the transform. So here instead of the render, you will be getting a transform. So just again in 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 the C sharp code, this get component tells you uh, this get component will choose one of the components here. You need to name know the name of the type of the component of its class, actually. So we know that the mesh renderer is called renderer that uh, that of course I found like this. So uh, infinity change script will probably oh this material set color. That's one of the options for sure. Um, but if you want to see what are the properties of the material object, for example, you see it has color. It has a texture, yeah? so we can change the texture, change for some uh, different uh, different picture, if you have a picture there as a texture. And here it says, in order to get the material used by an object, use the render.material property. So if you have a render.material, here it also tells you how to get the component render render and if I click on render here it tells me all the different properties of the render so it has material but not only material it has some light map it has uh whatever yeah I mean like it's probably not not that interesting uh, to look through the renderer but something that that is more understandable and usable would be this transform 
And as you can guess, the transform has the position, it has the rotation, and it has the scale, like local scale, some other scale, but those are the um, those are the the properties you see here. So they are they have usually have like similar or the same names, but not all the time because as you've seen, mesh render is just called a renderer. But for that you have the you have the documentation always available. So that's what we do now today we finished with fundamentals number three scripting and tomorrow we'll continue with fundamentals number four any questions not a question but i would like to add that when you are uh, adding components to a certain <clears throat> object yeah you must save the file because if you don't then each time you are running the game you will have to add the components again Okay. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. So that's a good point. But by default, I think. Uh, so if you're not uh, the first important thing again, you you have to do the changes outside of play mode. Yeah. Uh, here, the scene itself, it's a file. It's a file living here under scenes. So if, if if it has this asterisk here, the star here, it's not saved and you have to save it. But uh, usually on play, is it saved or not? Yeah, okay. So in all the versions, when you hit play, it automatically saved the scene. But yeah, with control S or save, uh, because if you don't do it and then reload the scene, you would lose all the changes you made in, in the scene. Yeah. Uh, since we are mostly working with a single scene, it's not that of an issue, but it could lead to uh, to some very unpleasant surprises. So yes, of course, save your work often, especially in Unity, because uh, Unity also has this weird uh, bad habit of breaking very often, dying very often, and losing all your work. So yeah, just e even if it doesn't happen today or during the workshop, at, at some point you will lose two days of work of because of a Unity crash. That's kind of inevitable. inevitable. So yeah, say, save, save your work often. Anything else? No, 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 no. Okay, in that case, I guess see you tomorrow. Uh, I don't know what was Volga's plan about what time we meet, but you said most of you, or you all want to come again at 12, or or was it you? you, you? I, I want to come up at 12 tomorrow. Yeah?